Okay, so we're um, through the philosophizing part, now we're going to get into the theorizing part. Um, slightly less abstract. Uh, so we're going to talk about trying to um, get away a little bit from linear movement towards thinking about rhythmic complements. Uh, a little less on progressive development, more on contextual spreading, less on directional control, and more on implicit propensities. And we'll have the exercise of hastening, retarding versus copying. That'll be some interesting uh, rethinking. Okay, so if we're not thinking in time, the questions we have to deal with, and when we're talking about system changes, is, and this gets back to the original question of what's a system's change and what's just a change. Um, so we can think about it in terms of shifts between states, shifts in behaviors, or shifts of regimes. Um, so a shift between states is like falling asleep and waking up. That's normal, normal rhythm, right? So people wake up or they go to sleep every day. It's not usually a big deal. We just think that's the way the system works. Um, shift in behavior could be like uh, people say you should always oh, should exercise more. So we could talk about that, and, and that is actually a, a shift, which is a minor shift, like you exercise more a day, you give yourself more time to do that. But we also have about uh, what are called regime shifts. So particularly in the elect, in the uh, ecological, in the social ecological systems world, they're now doing research on climate ecological regime shifts. Uh, but a regime shift is not just like waking and waking up, right? It's actually a real change, something that is irreversible or uh, significant. So in trying to move away and change the way that we think about the world, uh, one way is, if you have to look at the ancient Greek philosophy, Western science is essentially based off straight lining, point to point. And it's about one, and it's about dealing in motion, and so it's not quite enough to be dealing in just, say, you're dealing with process. You have to deal with a little bit more. In Chinese philosophy, which gets to be confusing, you have the idea of complements. So you've got waves, and worse yet, you've got waves that are complementary to each other. So when the blue line goes up, the brown line goes down and they're tied together like this. And so this is the dyadic part of yin-yang that gets confusing to people because you can't say just yin, and you can't say just yang, it has to be yin-yang together. It's complementary to each other. People are familiar with the yin-yang symbol, but the way you should think about this is in terms of time. Utmost yang, so you can think about this at noontime, is the brightest part of the day. It doesn't mean that there isn't any darkness out there, but it, there, it, it is uh, the brightest part at noon, and at midnight, it is the utmost yin, which is the darkest time, and you've got the sunrise and the sunset between, and you've got that going around. So the idea of the swirl, they're trying to capture in a single image, but actually it doesn't capture well. Here's another way of looking at uh, yin yang, and this is in terms of body clock on uh, Chinese medicine. And so you have at 6 a.m., the large intestine is at uh, most control. Um, the funny thing about large intestine is the reason that in, in Chinese medicine, and I think Western medicine as well, the reason when, when we're jet lagged, it's a little over here from North America, and we're jet lagged, the reason that people wake up is because of your bowels. Your bowels have to actually adjust to the time zone you're in. So um, when it, it takes a while for it to do that. Uh, at noon, the heart is at maximum. Um, and if you actually are going to have a heart attack, it's going to most likely happen at noon. So in the Chinese philosophy, this idea of the clock is actually working here. Now, if you actually get more abstract and away from the body part of it, if you look at your cosmology, you have the idea of qi as atmosphere. Now, the trick about qi and talking about a one thing is, is really hard because it's both matter and not matter. And how can it be like, how can it be both matter and not matter? Well, it's a process. It's a process, it's not a thing that happens. And so we have waxing and waiting happening. We have greater yang, 
and then she in concentrating mode. So we have it, uh, we start off here with maximum yang. Now maximum mong yang is immaterial, and maximum yin is material. So what you have in this cycle is the idea that you, when people say, you know, that qi is like energy, it's kind of like, no, you got the wrong. Qi is not energy because also matter. So you have this idea of process, which is that qi is in concentrating mode. So you start off, if you want to say, in heaven and earth. It starts off in heaven and it gradually comes down to earth and then it goes from earth back up to heaven again. And that's the way the philosophy works. So the qi in concentrating mode and the qi in dissipating mode, I'll remind you back to the beginning when I was talking about pepper. And we had the formism and the mechanism, the organicism and the contextualism. In effect, that is what pepper was doing in the Western philosophy with pragmatism, American pragmatism. But in the Chinese philosophy, they also have the idea of concentrating and dissipating. Here's the other way of drawing it and maybe more helpful and thinking about it here. And this is um, uh, of the year. So we got uh, summer, autumn, winter, spring. So maximum brightness is at summer solstice. Maximum darkness is at winter solstice. And you've got now the swirling symbols happening as they go around. So this is a process oriented way of looking at the world totally. And if you come and think of it from a a, uh, a, a change in state sort of thing that it's matter and then not matter. It's like, uh, the philosophy doesn't work that way. So this this one you have to think about time and think about rhythms. Originally, the primordial dyad was yang is the sunny side of a hill and yin is the shady side of the hill. And that invents its correspondence in Chinese tradition. And so what happens is that Everything you can think about yin and yang as two phases in cyclical movement. So you have light, dark, sun, moon, brightness, shade, all these sorts of things here. You have it as two states of density and matter. So immaterial, material produces energy, produces form. And so you have energy here and form here. So it's a transformation here. You have it going yang to yin. And so that would be concentrating. You have pure energy going into form. And then from form going back into energy, you have dissipating. Generates, grows, non substantial, standard, energy, matter, all those. And in Chinese medicine, you have these in clinical practice fire, water, heat, cold. Remember, I was talk talking about brandy being warming and uh, uh, scotch being cold. And so here it is, right here. Uh, restless, quiet, dry. And so that it's not just Chinese medicine, but if you think about the science that's behind yin yang, it comes from a different point of view. So yin, this is when. Um, Peacock Lee writes that you can't judge a dog in a cat show and you can't judge a dog in a cat show. And so when you're looking at Chinese science, you can't judge it by Western standards because the ideas of yin and yang are embedded in the Chinese science, whereas in Western science, well, it doesn't make any sense. Does it exist or doesn't exist? And you go, no, it's not about whether it exists or doesn't exist. It's not about, about the thing. It's about the transformation between the two. Is one transformed to the other or not? Chinese tend to treat opposites as complementary, and the West treats them as conflicting. So the earliest pairs they get, uh, again, yin and yang is heaven, earth, spring, autumn. You have them in, the, in that way. Big states, small states. Uh, elder brother, younger brother. So um, there's, there's an interesting YouTube video called The Complicated Chinese Family. Because everyone in the Chinese family has a different name. You refer to that. So they have the eldest brother, you have the second brother, the third brother, the younger brother. And you can kind of go through that. They all have all that. And people uh, actually learn to have those names. Uh, and then the, the cosmic. Uh, heaven and earth, fire and water, sun and moon. So they always have these pairs, these dyadic pairs that, uh, that are in the Chinese philosophy. Now, trying to translate this for you, we're talking about the circle and how the circle works. It's a nice animation. Uh, and then we have uh, yin and yang, which are in phase with each other. So you actually see how the circle generates two of them. And that's how you get the yin and yang. And ideally, we should be describing them as verbs, not as nouns. So illuminating, darkening, working, resting, warming, cooling, rising, descending. 
because they're processes, they're not actually states. Okay, a little Chinese medicine now. Uh, you, you, if you now get used to the yin yang idea, uh, so here we have yin and yang that are in balance in a normal range, but this actually happens in, uh, in, in the context of changes in the day. If you went to a Chinese doctor and you're saying, I'm feeling hot and sweaty, you know, during the day, and then at cold at night, I'm really cold. What they would say is that you have excess, excess yang. So in this case, the blue line, the yang is above what should be normal, um, and it's out of synchrony. It's out of synchrony, out of diachrony, out of diachrony. Excuse me, I've got to It's it's uh, not diachronic with the flow, and so this is out of balance because it should actually be within. But what happens is during the day both yin and yang go down. So at the end of the day, you have this, which is, in effect, the yang is in a normal range, but your yin is low. And so this is what they have called consumed heat, consumed versus excess, right? And this is because you have the transformation between the material and the immaterial. Now, in Chinese medicine, it actually gets more complicated because they have five elements, and the five element theory, but I don't actually want to go to five element theory because five element theory is really only for human bodies and not necessarily true for other systems. So I'm staying with yin yang. Um, but you have these four conditions and, and this is what a Chinese doctor does, is that this is what they're looking for. They're looking for that balance. Now if you go to a, a, um, a Western doctor, I actually did this, I asked my doctor and I said, um, how's my pulse? And he says, your pulse changes when you walk across a room, it's irrelevant. Like, well, that's not what the Chinese doctors say. The Chinese doctors are actually looking for this balance. They're looking for it to be like this, not like any of the other conditions. Okay. Uh, second part, progressive development versus contextual threading. So organicism frames synthesis as parts holes, um, with parts with parts in the holes. And so before, when I talked about um, Mechanism. Mechanism was the ability to take things apart analytically, but if you were trying to put things together, that is synthesis. So you do synthesize a car if you're talking about assembling a car. And a lot of system thinking that we talk about traditionally is about this part-whole relation. Now the better one, and this is actually the best metaphor I have of thinking about yin-yang. Can you think about the situation where you have a couple, that's a pair, Dancing in a room of other people dancing. And these are all in time now. So this is the way that we should be thinking about systems. We think about systems as a pair, and they're in a room dancing. And you kind of go, well, what if we just look at one of the dancers? You go, no, 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 no. That's Western philosophy. Western philosophy says you can actually get down to a single dancer dancing by themselves. It's like, no. A Chinese philosophy says all the way down, it's always two. So there's always a couple dancing. Now the, the Chinese philosophy is compatible now with what we've seen from the Tim Ingold in ecological anthropology, where we have yin yang threads, so it's two of them that are coming alongside each other, and then occasionally they cross over and they weave with each other. And so Again, when you're talking before, maybe I should talk about traveling with my wife Diana here. We come together and we see each other. I'll see Jonathan and Amanda together. <laughs> a couple. We travel together. Uh, and we, but we tie a knot. So, you know, it, there's a time when we come together and then we go apart our own ways. But thinking this way, you, we've now extended, in effect, Tim Ingold's ideas of threads and lines with a dyadic being incompatible with what's in the Chinese philosophy. So in living systems, we tend to focus about the transformation and the development. And this is organicism. And when we talk about organicism, we can have the caterpillar going into the pupa and it turning into the butterfly. And we tend to think about that part-whole relationship in time. But we don't necessarily need that whole if we have the idea of dolphins swimming alongside each other, then it's like, well, do we need to talk about a hole? 
Do we need to talk about a system and environment per se? No, they're dolphins swimming along each other, the family. They come together in some points of time, they go apart other points of time, and we can think about them as threads in time rather than thinking about a whole. Now the trick is that when we talk about texture, people still, still tend to think about texture not, they didn't think of it in a Western sense, but if you thought about these as being in time, as threads that come together, not as, as, as a single place, you get a different orientation. One way of expressing this, if you can't think of a context, is think of four seasons of the year. So we always, we, do, we kind of ignore this. You do science, and the question you should be asking is, is this actually true in the winter or true in the summer? Um, one of the, uh, the diagnoses that Keacock Lee reports in, in her book is talking that, that this very famous doctor came and said, um, your yang is too high, it's winter now, in, if you don't fix something in your system, in summer you're going to be dead. Because heat in the, having too much heat in the winter is not a bad thing, having too much heat in the summer is going to threaten your life. And so he dies, his daughter comes back and says, you know, he wouldn't change, and this sort of stuff. But we actually don't think in science a lot about the changes of seasons, and perhaps we should think about them, because that is a context that changes. When we think about, uh, now we're going to the third section, on directional control versus implicit propensities, the West is, takes a commanding approach where we're steering for control. So the way we think about systems is that we have nature, but we're looking to control nature. The alternative is to think about propensities of the situation, because the system has momentum and a way of operating, and what we can do is actually maybe change it, or maybe alter it a little bit, but we can't deny it. So the question is, do we control nature, or do we not control nature? A Western approach says we start with the supposition that we can control nature. A Chinese approach says, well, every system has what they call a propensity. And with a propensity, systems lean a certain way. They're constantly toggling over to their weight and hanging quality, the Latin is pandera, in one way or another, uh, in a situation, and they produce their own future with momentum and drive. So the idea of a system having its own way is, is something that's built into the Chinese philosophy. Now, if you, if you want to tie this back into the organizational sense, we start talking about um, self-organizing groups, uh, autonomous work groups, as they did with uh, Emory and Trist when they're doing that original socio-technical research, the same idea, that you want people to do what people are going to do. So if you're going to design a system, do you actually want to have a system where you define the job for them, and then you say, fit into this job, or do you want to do it with a propensity approach, which is, okay, how would you do this job? And I have a team, so you know, if you don't like doing so much paperwork, maybe you do less paperwork. And I get this other person who loves paperwork to do that. Work with the propensity of the people as opposed to trying to control them so much. We go back to the ancient Greeks where decisions are focused on controlling the outcomes with action. Um, we have some cattle herding here. Uh, we have fences put up. This is definitely a control situation. We actually want the, uh, the cattle to be a certain place, and so we are forcing them and channeling them in that direction. The idea of propensity comes up in a different way in with situational timing and favorable or unfavorable timing. Um, here we have some fishing, angling, as they say. You're angling for fish. Uh, we have a little bit of uh, bait down here. And uh, the fish are nibbling, but they actually not necessarily biting. And so, you know, fishing is different from, from cattle herding. And here we're actually putting out the bait, and the question is, when are we going to get a fish that actually is going to take that bait? And that's a situational sort of thing. Uh, where we get the fish? Oh, got it. But you don't go when the fish aren't biting. So this leads to the question about, about elevating the idea of when and where over, elevate, over the idea of, where, uh, of what, and where, what and why. So the Western philosophy is much more about what and why about controlling. The Chinese philosophy is less about control 
and says, okay, we work with the time and the place. It's like going fishing. You go fish when the fish are biting. There's no point in going fishing if, if the fish aren't going to bite. This leads to the idea of Wu Wei in Chinese philosophy. Now, Wei is actually about the uh, about force. And <coughs> people talk about Wu Wei, and the bad translation about Wu Wei is non-action or not doing things. But you have to think more about propensity. So the idea would be: Do you actually uh, do you actually take willful action, which is the old way, or do you take non-intrusive action, which is having systems do what systems are going to do? Do you work with nature or do you work against nature? So the idea of way is do your acting. Wu means nothing or not is a, is a negative. Uh, but the application of force or power determination, Wu Wei is leaving things alone, letting nature take its course, going, get, going with the grain, and knowing how to not interfere. And there's bad translations of it. But the idea then is when you have a system, and you're going to have a system, you're going to try to change that system. Is it the natural thing that they're going to change? Is there a good time to change the system? As opposed to asking whether you should or should not change the system, the question would be when is the system going to change? If we go to Aristotle, we tend to think about causes and effects and plans and actions. It's like a uh, shooting billiards here. Um, kind of control the world, you have the balls lined up, you hit a ball, and you can actually chain events. That's one way of viewing the world. Here's another way of viewing the world. I found this really interesting shot since I was in Scotland recently. This is in Glasgow. The people running in the rain, which happens every day, right? You're caught in the rain, you've got people standing in, in, the, in the storefronts, they're waiting for the rain to, to come and go. Now, this is one way of looking at the world, which is, why are people standing, well, for, why, why are the people running in the rain, because they're trying to get somewhere, why are they standing in the storefronts? Because they think it's going to stop raining. There's a rhythm there that's happening. It's not going to rain forever. After a certain point, they may get tired and say, oh, it's not going to stop. But there's this logic that happens that says, well, you know, we'll just wait for the rain to stop, because it's going to stop sometime. That is waiting for the time, waiting, that being auspicious time, being appropriate time. You can't control everything like you control here with billiards. It's a different philosophy. Another way of looking at this is Western causality, which is directing Yahweh. Um, sandbagging. So we have a flood. Sandbagging is direct action. That's not a bad thing. It is to try to control nature, but it's controlling nature through the direct way possible that we can do it. An indirect way of looking at it would be beaver ponds. Could we introduce beavers in, and would they actually restore nature so we don't get flooding? And they can, except that we kind of overlay on top of that. But uh, often in the discussions we have in System Changes Learning Circle, we, all, we often ask about, well, how would beavers think about this? Would they build houses, they move on, you know, they don't like the sound of leaks. Um, but they don't take the direct control in the same way that we do in the Western sense, the Western, side, the Western training of science. So, here's the exercise. Um, can we deprecate the hasting or retarding of the anticipated? Okay, this is the, the part where I have a drummer here. Um, this is actually the mad drummer I discovered. And, and uh, what happens is uh, you've got a second drummer who's actually going to push this guy off the stage. He has a rhythm. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like one drummer trying to control, and it's like, oh, I want to take control. Push the guy off the stage. That's one way of approaching drumming. I'm going to give you another one, which is actually a jazz performance, and you've got to listen to this one because it's going to be sound. And this is during, um, uh, a, right after a violin solo.
case, we have what's called in, in, um, used in a, a jazz sense, comping. So the drummer is doing more than playing 4-4. Four, four. The drummer is actually adding to the music, right? Um, but they're grooving. And so the question would be, can you get into a groove when you're trying to do a systems change? Which is, there's already a natural rhythm happening that you could add to that rhythm as opposed to, uh, as opposed to fighting that rhythm. Now, if we're thinking in a pure sense, the idea is not about drumming or not drumming. It's about hastening, speeding up the rhythm, or retarding, slowing down the rhythm. Now, this comes into the Chinese philosophy because when you talk about everything existing in time and there's a natural rhythm of the way that things happen, philosophically, the best you could say is, I might be able to slow down the nature of the world, or I might be able to speed up the nature of the world a bit, but it's going to happen. This isn't deterministic in the way that we think about it in the West. One of the interesting um, things that's come up in, in Chinese uh, culture, in, in Chinese thinking that people don't really express is, in the West, we have the idea of, of the past, the present, and the future. In the Chinese language, there is no tense. There is only now. So if I say I'm going to do something, I'd say I'm going to do it tomorrow. There's no, like, um, you know, there, there's no saying, you know, that I, and so I'll play it tomorrow or I'll do something, but they add on the extra word. But the assumption is everything is in the present. They don't have something in the future. But they do have the idea built in that there is something that happens next because there is a rhythm. So something will happen, and it will happen within the rhythm, and a rhythm is anticipatory because you have a system that's operating, and it will operate in a certain way. But then the question is, can we actually get to that change? So already it's a leap to get to thinking about thinking in rhythms, but then the question is, can we actually influence the rhythms with propensity or change it in the Wu Wei sort of way, where we do beavers as opposed to trying to build dams with sandbags? So we're going to take another break uh, with this exercise and see what you can think about this. So we'll take a break and we'll come back and talk some more. <laughs>